Hi, everyone. Welcome to Grace for Today. I am Pastor Aaron Perdue here at Karis Christian Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Thanks so much for joining us this week. It's going to be awesome. I'm sharing a brand new series on Galatians. I've entitled it Called to Liberty. Jesus has called us to liberty. He wants us to be truly free. So we're going to be sharing on this all week. I actually have a four-part series on Galatians called to Liberty. If you'd like to order this, you can contact us here at the ministry. We'd be happy to send it to you. So if you have your Bible there at home, go ahead and dive in uh, to Galatians with me. We're going to jump into Galatians, one of my favorite books in the Bible. You know, many of you have probably listened to my dad, Pastor Lawson Purdue, here on the show, but he loves Galatians. Um, I, I remember when I first moved here to Colorado to become a pastor about five years ago, I was at his house um, thumbing through his Bible and uh, the, the book of Galatians was just covered in ink pages were falling out and um, you know, I was always a little bit intimidated to dive into Galatians because I knew I knew it was his favorite book of the Bible because it highlights God's grace we all need to understand grace we all need a revelation of what God's grace is we all need a revelation of who Jesus is you know one of my favorite verses in the Bible is in Galatians it's from uh, chapter 2 verse 20 it says I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How awesome is that? God's grace is so amazing. What Jesus has done for us is so incredible. There are um, three important aspects of grace I want to communicate uh, throughout this series, but grace, um, it frees us. You know, that's talking about saving grace. A lot of people understand that grace frees, you know, uh, Jesus came to forgive us of our sins. Grace frees us from our past, but grace does a lot more than just free us. Grace also transforms us, just like it says here in Galatians 2.20, that we aren't the same old things have passed away. All things have become new. Uh, we, we've been crucified with Christ. Um, you know, we have been transformed by grace, but not only that, you know, Jesus, um, he, you know, he transforms us into a brand new creation. But lastly, grace also empowers us. There's an empowering side of grace. You know, Jesus wants us to, to live that abundant life. He wants to empower us with his goodness, fill us with the Holy Spirit, um, enable us to do everything he has called us to do. It's actually impossible to live the Christian life without the power of Jesus, without the power of grace. So grace, yes, it frees us, but it also transforms us and it equips us. So Jesus, you know, he wants to set you free, completely free. I love this title. He's called us to liberty. You know, the very first message that Jesus preached, you know, as a minister, when he began his earthly ministry, um, the very first message is recorded in Luke 4, uh, starting in verse 16. So you can look there, Luke 4, verse 16 through 19. It says, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus is calling people to liberty even today. I believe that if you, if you feel like you're in bondage, Jesus is calling you to liberty, to complete freedom right now in right now through Jesus. So uh, what did Jesus come to set us free from? I want to ask you that question. Maybe you can think about it right now, but what did Jesus come to set us free from? He came to set us free from sin, from our past failures, from our past mistakes, but he also came to set us free from the law. And that's what Galatians kind of focuses on. Law keeping, it's like trying to be good enough to be accepted before God. Jesus was saying, I will make you accepted before God. You can't make yourself good enough. So he actually kept a, set us free from law keeping. He set us free from performance-based religion. Um, he came to, to unite us, to put us in a, in a love relationship with God, a son and daughter, a family kind of relationship with God. And you can't achieve that through, through law keeping, through performance-based religion. So he came to set us free from sin, 
came to set us free from the power of sin, from the effects of sin, from the curse of sin. He came to set us free from uh, law keeping, but he also came to set us free from ourselves. Sometimes you can get so wrapped up in yourself and, and making it about you. Jesus wants you to be free from yourself. He wants you to live for him and have a life just completely, um, just full of joy, full of power, full of Jesus. And you can't do that when you're just focused on yourself all the time. So true freedom is found in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus wants us to be completely free. And man, when you have Jesus in your heart, that changes everything. So why did Paul write this um, book, this letter to the, the churches in Galatia? You know, Galatia, it's an area um, where there are several churches. Um, but why did Paul write this um, letter just explaining what grace is, explaining um, why we need faith? Why did he write this? Well, he wrote this because he actually planted several churches in that area of Asia Minor. And after he had left, um, after he planted those churches, people came in, other ministers came in behind him, and they were um, challenging um, the, the doctrine that Paul had preached. So that these people were called Judaizers, and they were, um, you know, they were leaders, they were ministers that said, uh, Jesus doesn't do everything for you. You still need to keep the law. You know, these Gentile believers, you still need to follow certain aspects of the law in order to be right before God, in order to be made righteous before God. It's not just Jesus alone. You have to do other things. You have to keep parts of the law. And, um, you know, one thing that they said you have to do, you have to be circumcised in order to, to be saved, to fully experience salvation. So Paul insisted that salvation was by grace through faith. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So these Judaizers, they were saying um, it's Jesus plus something. Um, equals salvation. Now they were challenging what Paul had said. They were trying to discredit Paul. They, they called him a secondhand apostle. They were really trying to throw Paul under the bus. But Paul, he writes this, and he's very bold in his proclamation of grace, this doctrine of grace, his revelation of grace. So let's dive in here, uh, Galatians chapter 1. Here in this first day, I want to kind of go through the first two chapters of Galatians. So here in Galatians 1, let's start right in the very first verse. It says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. I love that. He says, I'm an apostle called by Jesus Christ. And he's kind of saying that because these other people, these Judaizers, were trying to discredit him, saying he's not a real apostle. He's a secondhand apostle. He wasn't even a part of Jesus's, you know, ministry when Jesus walked on the earth. But Paul is saying, Jesus Christ has called me to, to be an apostle, to, to preach this message of the gospel, to preach grace wherever I go, to go to to the Gentiles and save them um, through the power of God. So he's saying, um, Jesus Christ has called me to this. Verse two, he says, to all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. He, he's saying that Jesus Christ called me. You know, God has a plan. He has a purpose for everyone watching this show right now. And I believe that right now, Jesus is even speaking to you, calling you to specific things, um, to do specific things, but also to minister to specific people, to be um, messengers of that, that um, message of reconciliation, that God wants to reconcile himself to people through Jesus Christ. He wants to save people. He loves people. I believe that all of you watching this, everyone who believes on Jesus, you are called to a specific ministry, to, to minister to specific people. They might be in your family. They might be friends at work. They might be your neighbors. But I believe that Jesus is calling you to minister to specific people. Paul knew that he was called specifically to, men, uh, to minister to the Gentile nations. So let's go on here. If you know that Jesus has called you to something, you know that he's going to keep you. He's going to take care of you. So um, Paul's saying, I am, I am, Jesus is keeping me. Um, he's, he is keeping me um, in the ministry, but he, he's keeping me in my relationship with God. You know, our, our um, spirit, our, our inner spiritual GPS should always be pointed to Jesus. So he's saying, you know, some of you, I can tell from, from these um, false teachers, your, your, your spiritual GPS is pointing in the wrong direction. It's starting to point to the law. It's starting to point at yourself. What do you have to do 
to, to be right before God. But he said, no, that's completely wrong. It needs to be 100% pointed at Jesus. If you want to be right before God, you have to be completely pointed in the direction of Jesus. And you know, legalism, it screws up your spiritual GPS. It starts pointing at other things. You know, what do other people think about me? What do I think about myself? I mean, what is the enemy saying about me? Am I good enough? Your spiritual GPS should always be pointed at at Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. It's not about what you do. It's about Jesus and what he has already accomplished um, through his death, burial, and resurrection. So he, uh, Paul just gets right on it um, here in verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to another gospel. He's saying, you're, you're, um, your spiritual GPS is, is going out of whack. It's not pointed at due north. It's not pointed at Jesus. You're turning away. You're making, you're turning it to the law, you know, to the Old Testament law. You're turning it to yourself. You're turning it to other people who aren't really on track um, doctrinally. So he's saying, I'm marveling that you're turning away so soon. And all of us as believers, even um, believers like myself who are, who are very much grace, um, you know, grace and faith, um, people like our, our church here, Charis Christian Center, that means, uh, Charis means grace, but we constantly have to remind ourselves and, and just be rooted and grounded in the grace message. So I, I love going to Galatians. It's, it's a book you need to go to often. Just to remind yourself, it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about my works. It's about Jesus and his finished work. Um, verse seven, he's saying, um, this is, it's not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So he's saying, you know, adding works to what Jesus has already done is a perversion. Um, verse eight, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So he's saying this, this gospel of grace that is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He's saying this is a very serious thing. Um, it, it's, it's extremely serious. So he's saying, um, if people try to add anything to Jesus, he's calling it heresy. Uh, verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you receive, let him be accursed. Verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For I still, if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He's saying, I, I am serving Jesus Christ first and foremost. Let's go on here in verse 11. You know, I love what Paul talks about here. He actually shares some of his former uh, story about his, his, how he came um, to have a revelation of who Jesus was, have a revelation of the message of grace, the gospel of grace. Verse 11, Paul says this, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, you know, um, understanding grace, it's not just something that you can learn information wise. It has to be something that's given to you deep in your spirit. It has to come by spiritual revelation from Jesus Christ, from his, from his Holy Spirit. Um, verse 13, for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and then returned again to Damascus. So um, once, you know, we, we kind of, a lot of us know the conversion story of Paul when he was still Saul of Tarsus. He, he was um, high up in the, the circles of Judaism and um, he was actually persecuting the church. Uh, the Bible even says that Stephen, the first martyr, was martyred at the feet of, of Saul at the time. Um, so he was, um, you know, didn't have this revelation of who Jesus was, didn't believe in Jesus as Lord, didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. But um, he, he was, uh, Jesus appeared to him and called him to be a minister. Jesus revealed himself to him. And uh, what, what Paul did, uh, he actually went into the desert, into, into Arabia here for a period of time, for almost three years before he, he um, went seeking a position. So he knew he was called into ministry. He knew that Jesus spoke to him personally, but he um, just wasn't seeking um, 
people, you know, people's applause or, or people to promote him. He just went into the desert and spent time with God. And here in 18, uh, verse 18, we see what happens after these three years. It says he went to Jerusalem to see Peter and remain with him for 15 days. So he was only with Peter for 15 days. It says, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. It says, afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by, the, by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So he didn't um, stay around where where you know, the hub of Christianity was at the time. He didn't stay in, in the Jerusalem area. He went to uh, places that hadn't heard about Jesus yet. So he just spent 15 days in Jerusalem with Peter, with James, and then he went off on his own, um, you know, t evangelizing, telling people about Jesus, going to these Gentile people who never heard about Jesus. And he did that because Jesus said, you're going to go to the Gentile people. So he did that. Um, you know, Peter and James sent him off and he wasn't really known by the by the Mecca of Christianity at the time, you know, word later on went back to them. You know, they got word back hearing about what had been happening, um, you know, in places like Philippi and Antioch and Corinth, where, where Paul was seeing great revival. Um, so it says here, let's go on into chapter two now. Uh, I want to go into chapter two. So he kind of talks about what brought him back to Jerusalem. So what brought Paul back to Jerusalem after 14 years? So he'd been ministering. Um, you know, all through the Gentile world, traveling around, going on his missionary journeys. And then after 14 years, um, something compelled him to go back to Jerusalem. So what was it? Um, he went to back to Jerusalem because he had to stand up for, for um, what he was preaching, what he was seeing, this revival in the, in the, in, in the lives of the Galatian people, uh, in, in, in the Gentile people. Um, so... So in Jerusalem, people were debating, you know, um, these Gentiles who are getting saved, do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to keep the law? Do they have to follow um, all of our Jewish traditions um, or do they not? So is it Jesus plus nothing or do we have to have Jesus plus, you know, do these certain um, traditions of our Jewish fathers? Um, so it says uh, in chapter two, verse one, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Um, so he, he said he went to Jerusalem, he took Barnabas, and he took Titus. So um, why did he take these particular um, people with him? Um, Paul, you know, we know Paul's background. He was a, a Jew. Um, growing up, he, he was a devout follower of the law. And actually, um, when Paul kind of talks about his, you know, how, how strictly he kept the law, he mentions this in Philippians 3, um, starting in verse 3 through 6. He said, you know, if anyone has the right to be confident in the flesh, talking about, you know, your own performance, what I can do, how, how good I am at keeping the law. Paul said, um, you know, if, if it's about what you can do about law keeping, I, I'm the best law keeper there is. I kept the law. Um, closer than anyone. He said, I, I was a better Jew than anyone. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. He said, I was blameless concerning the righteousness from the law. So Paul, um, I believe he shared this message. This was his heart when he went to Jerusalem saying, you know, it's not about law keeping. I used to keep the law, but I had zero relationship with God. I did not know Jesus. I did not know God's um, truth about salvation. If you want to make it about law keeping, look at me. Law keeping does not make you right before God. I had zeal. I had passion. I kept the law, but that gave me zero relationship with God. And he also took Titus with him. Why did he take Titus? He's because that was one of his converts, someone who was a, a pastor now. Paul had set him up as a pastor who was also um, preaching Jesus, preaching grace, um, seeing people get saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, delivered, healed. So he said, look at Titus here. You know, Titus is a Greek. He's not even circumcised. He's not living according to the law of Moses, but he has an awesome relationship with God. It's based completely on Jesus. You know, his salvation, all the promises of God to him, they are completely available through Jesus. You know, and people were upset that he took Titus there into Jerusalem. Why, why were some of these um, um, early leaders in the church upset that he took Titus there into Jerusalem? We can read about it here in chapter 2. So let's go on in chapter 2. 
Uh, starting in verse three. So it says, yet not even Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. So he's saying Titus um, wasn't keeping everything in the law. He wasn't even circumcised, which according to you know, Jewish um, beliefs, that's a very important thing. Um, and, and, you know, observing the law um, established by Moses. So he's saying Titus um, hasn't even been circumcised. Verse four, and this occurred because of uh, false brethren uh, secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might bring, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So he's saying people were really upset that Titus was there. You know, Titus is a Greek. He, he eats Greek food. He doesn't keep kosher. He's not circumcised. They're, they're upset that Paul brought Titus um, there uh, to defend the gospel, to defend their ministry. And, um, you know, you can see what legalism does to people. Legalism causes people to miss the big picture. You know, Paul was uh, experiencing uh, tremendous revival in, in the Gentile nations with Gentile people. And people, uh, a lot of people couldn't get over the fact that Titus wasn't circumcised. They, they were so legalistic, they missed the big picture. They, they couldn't uh, see what God was doing in the Gentile nations. You know, people were being saved, healed, delivered, filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, just like on the day of Pentecost that happened in Jerusalem, you know, people are praying in tongues, laying hands on the sick, seeing them recover, but they couldn't get over the fact that Titus wasn't circumcised. That legalism, well, man, if you're legalistic, sometimes you can miss the big picture. You know, uh, all throughout the Bible, I see when God is doing a mighty move. Sometimes people are so obsessed about things that don't matter. Um, they miss out on, on some of the biggest moves of God. You know, don't miss out on a big move of God because you're legalistic and obsessing about things that do not matter. You know, in ministry, I've seen that people, um, you know, God could be moving mightily. There could be miracles, signs, wonders, people getting saved, and people can get obsessed and just fall apart over the smallest of things. Don't let that happen to you. You know, stand back and look at the big, big picture. Look at what God is doing. So he's saying, you know, I want you, Titus is an example of what God can do in, in, it's not about law keeping. You know, I kept the law, but that did not make me right before God. Only Jesus can free you. You know, don't miss the main thing. It's all about Jesus. So let's skip ahead just a little bit here. Go into verse 11. Uh, verse 11, this is really interesting. So he brings up Peter. Um, Peter actually came to Antioch at some point during his ministry. So Antioch is in the Galatian area. Antioch is one of the, the cities uh, where Paul had planted a church in, in Galatia. So it said Peter came to Antioch and Peter was, you know, a mighty man of God, a mighty apostle of God, but he came to Antioch. And um, it says here, Paul said, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. So what was up with Peter? Why was Paul... Um, you're confronting Peter. And uh, he talks about why he was confronting Peter. Verse 12, it says, for before certain men came from James. So James was, uh, you know, a brother of Jesus. The, he was actually the, the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Certain people came from James um, and said he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. So Peter um, came to visit Antioch. Uh, Paul was there. There were, um, you know, uh, Gentile believers there. And Peter, you know, was excited that there were Gentile believers. Um, he was actually eating with them, enjoying life with them. But then when there were other Jewish believers who came from Jerusalem, Peter suddenly got uh, kind of religious. He got legalistic. Well, I don't want to offend these people from Jerusalem who say, you know, as a Jew, it's wrong to eat with a non-Jewish person. So you know, to not offend them, to appease them, I'm no longer going to be friends with these Greek believers. I'm not going to sit next to Titus when he eats. I'm going to, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the cool kid table with the, you know, the, the kosher um, people. So Paul, Paul said, what you're doing is wrong. Um, you're being a hypocrite. And, um, uh, uh, Paul is trying to remind him, you know, it's about Jesus completely. It's, it's not about uh, what you do to keep the law. Um, so, so he's even Peter had to be reminded of, of the grace message. It's all about grace. It's not about trying to keep the law or trying to appease people who are um, very zealous law followers. You know, your relationship with God, it is not based upon what other people think about you. 
That's a great word for someone today. Your relationship with God, it is not based upon what other people think about you. So Paul had to remind Peter of this. He had to remind Peter of the grace message. And if Paul had to remind Peter about this, I think it's good for us to remind ourselves. It is all about Jesus. It's not about law keeping. It is all about Jesus Christ. We are justified through Christ alone. I love what Paul says here in verse 17. Um, but if while we were we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For, for if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died in vain. Those are really big words. So he's saying, if you want to be saved, if you want to have a relationship with God, if you want to be seen as good before God, be justified before God, it's all about Jesus. The gospel equation is simply this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So I, I'm just imploring you all right now, um, dive into the word, dive into this. Um, man, Galatians is so awesome. It's, it's important to remind ourselves of, of the power of grace. You know, grace, it frees us, it transforms us, and it empowers us. Everything um, in our walk with God, it's, it's, it's through faith in his grace. It's not about what you do, it's about what he has already done for us. So don't set aside the grace of God. Keep coming back to grace. Keep coming back to Jesus. You know, in your heart, your, your um, spiritual GPS always, always needs to be pointed directly at Jesus. Religion, performance-based stuff, um, it, it, it screws up your GPS. It starts pointing at what other people think is right, what other people think about me, what you think about yourself, your GPS always needs to be pointed at Jesus. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope to see you again soon as we continue our series on Galatians, Called to Liberty. Thanks so much, God bless you, and see you again soon. Thanks for watching Grace for Today. This broadcast is made possible by our faithful partners. If you would like to become a partner, need prayer, or have a question, please call us at 719 418 4,000. Go to www.lawsonpadu.com or write us at P.O. Box 63733, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80962. See you next time on Grace for Today.